Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, and uh, I have no friends today. It's just me. Uh, but um, you might have friends. So one of the things that we're going to do when it's just you and me uh, this season is we're going to talk theology and why it matters, how to talk about it to your friends, because maybe you have some, even though I don't. Uh, we're going to be tackling big questions uh, about who God is, about what we believe, and and about why they matter, about how to talk about them. And so probably the first one that we're going to tackle is one of the trickier ones to explain. Why not jump in the pool? Uh, our first question uh, is is based in sort of the, the nature and, and the, the character of God. It's, it's, what does it mean that God is triune? Why is this important? Uh, see, we believe in the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. We have a whole big fancy creed about this called the Athanasian Creed, and it goes over and over and over and over and over again, so long that you almost want to sit down. And, you don't sit down in the middle of it, but uh, it says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. To have a triune God means that we have one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not like the Father is a third God and Jesus is a third God and the Holy Spirit is a third God, but the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. And not only is it hard to get your head around because the math isn't quite mathing and one plus one plus one does not equal one, but also um, people are quick to point out the word Trinity is not actually in the Bible. It's a man-made word, triangle, Trinity, three. Um, but even though the word Trinity is not in the Bible, uh, the Bible actually matters a lot for this. Because if, if I, for example, told you that there was this bird that um, said quack and liked to swim in ponds and really likes bread, I don't actually need to say the word duck to you. I, I described a duck. Um, and honestly, sometimes that might actually be more helpful because I can just yell duck. But if you've never actually seen a duck, you just don't want to hit your head on. That was a bad joke. I'm so sorry. I should bring people on this podcast. Otherwise, it's just me. Um, really, though, uh, why is it important that we have a triune God? Well, I, I think first and foremost, it's just that the scriptures reveal him this way. Um we believe in the God who has revealed himself to us through Holy Scripture. And so we probably want to believe in the God that is revealed to us in Holy Scripture. Um, a lot of people try to conceptualize God and you end up with a lot, a lot of weirdness. Like, who is God to you? How has God sort of revealed himself to you in your heart? And you can say, well, like, I can see God in the sky and the rainbow and bubbles. I, I, you can make up anything that you want. But really, one of the clearest pictures of the Trinity is... Uh, it's in Matthew chapter 3, the baptism of our Lord. Jesus came from the Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be done so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So you have a picture of, of the triune God here. You have God the Son being baptized. You have God the Father speaking from, from uh, the heavens. You have God the Holy uh, revealing himself as, as the dove uh, to, to rest upon Jesus uh, and, and here you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not three gods, but one God in action. And the in action is actually really why it, why it matters. See, as Lutherans especially, uh, we relate to the Trinity uh, chiefly through the person of the Son. Uh, because when we look at the scriptures, we find chiefly Jesus saving sinners. We find chiefly the comfort of justification. Uh, of that that story of Jesus dying on the cross to forgive you all your sins and rising from the grave. And so when we when we go into the scriptures, um, when we want to better understand them, uh, everything for us is going to start to come to the fact that like we need help down here. And that means we need Jesus down here. Uh, Second Corinthians, there's going to be a lot of Bible in this in this particular episode. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six reads, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, if we want to understand who God is, we look to Jesus. 
It is nobody comes to the Father except through me, Jesus, that helps us better understand God. Because if God is simply just sort of the biggest force in the universe, like again, you can define that as a lot of stuff and it's not always helpful. But if you start with this idea that, that we're looking chiefly for the person of the Son, you find him like from the beginning to the end. In fact, it's not just like there's a few proof texts about a trinity, uh, but but rather the whole thing sings of it. Even from like Genesis chapter one, uh, in the beginning was the the um, the let there be light, let, let there, all of, Genesis chapter one, verses one to four actually speaks of God, the father creating the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the deep. And even the son who is the word of God is the thing that speaks to say, let there be light. The story of redemption is already being told. Light is being brought uh, to confront darkness. Life is being made out, uh, out of water uh, and formed uh, as God would knit us together over and over again. You have uh, the picture of, of, hope in Christ being played out. And that's why it matters that, that we have a triune God. We, we see it all this way. And then the scriptures get a little bit less choppy too. And we're always looking for that one salvific story of Jesus saving sinners. And it matters that we have a triune God because Jesus saves sinners by dying. God died for you. The Father did not die. The Holy Spirit did not die, but the Son died. And here again, we, we need a trinity because uh, we need a God who conquers death, that we would no longer be subject to it. And so it matters to us, uh, for the Son of Man has not come to serve, but to be served. No, that's backwards. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And here we have, again, Jesus dying. And so it matters here because if I died, that's, that's, that's me. But if it is God who perfectly fulfills the whole law of God and then gives his life, that's not just enough to save himself. That's enough to save us all. See, over and over again, it matters when we have a triune God because we want to talk about justification. It's not just because we want a God who is more complex than us uh, or, or, or just because God is more complex than us. It's not even just because God reveals himself to be triune. It's because God reveals himself to be triune so that, so that he can reveal himself to be the God who dies and rises for you. Everything, everything for us as Lutherans comes to this. Now, there are Bible verses that you can go to for, for this. Um, is the Son God. Yes, you can go to John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 5 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word that was God was made flesh. Jesus is God, and God became man. Uh, you have Colossians chapter 3, uh, 13 to 20. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's everything that we've talked about, just like Paul being more eloquent than me. Uh, I can't even comment on it. But if you need it from the words of Jesus himself, John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. See, Jesus uses the, the divine name of God, Yahweh, I am, which is a name that nobody was allowed to say. See, the, the Pharisees did not want to throw rocks at Jesus because he said that he is old, but because he said that he is God. That, that's a, actually an offense to them worthy of that punishment. Um, Jesus himself claims to be God and then also dies and stops being dead to sort of back up the claim, because it's a bold claim. Uh, is the Holy Spirit God? Yes, there's a Bible verse. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? What remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, 
but to God. To lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God because the Holy Spirit is, is God. But here's the thing. In all of it, we relate to God through the person of the Son who is delivered by the Holy Spirit. See, it is, it is the Holy Spirit who brings you to Jesus and Jesus to you. And it is through Jesus that we have access to the Father. It's Romans 15, verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Everything happens through the work of Christ, his death and his resurrection. And so the reason that we talk about the Trinity, uh, it, it's not just because we... we want to, to sort of get into the most complex parts of, of the stuff that we can't explain all that well in the first place, because you can't really explain the Trinity. You can only confess the Trinity. All of our attempts to explain the Trinity uh, fall short, and there's satirical Lutheran videos making fun of it. Um, really, it, it falls into heresy real quick because God is bigger than we can imagine, and that's, that's a comfort. But so that we can receive God, we can receive God through very simple things, and so that we can receive comfort, we have a God who dies and rises to save sinners. See, the Trinity is already something I don't understand. So instead of trying to make it even harder, we have something simpler. As Lutherans, we have Jesus for sinners over and over again. If you come from like a Pentecostal background, an enthusiastic background, you tend to go looking directly for the Holy Spirit. Uh, you have the, the Spirit apart from means, apart from the Bible, apart from the sacrament. You sort of skip the Son to get to the Father right through the Spirit. There's sort of like secret knowledge. There, there's sort of secret feelings that, that you can know that you're really in the Spirit. You can feel that you're really close to God. Um, the, the evangelicals will, will look chiefly for like God having a plan, God being in control, the Father is in control of all things, and you sort of end up, again, skipping the Son. Um, and if you end up skipping the Son, you end up skipping the cross. You end up skipping the grace. You end up skipping the gospel. You end up skipping the mercy. You have law that dominates both then. See, the Pentecostals with chaos and, and the evangelicals with order, but both are seeking Eden all over again. Both are seeking perfection through the works that we would do. Um, the Pentecostal through somehow trying to transcend above the flesh to have this sort of spiritual experience uh, that, that jumps right back to before things were broken. Uh, the evangelical by trying to find a perfect creation through their works, through God's control, in all of it, um, we're contending with the biggest problem that we have with God. And it's not just that we cannot quite explain the triune God with math, it's that things are broken down here. It's that everything is awful. We're dying. Sin hurts, breaks stuff. It's full of suffering. And where is God in a world that looks like this? Um, so for us, we have to go looking for Jesus. To explain the triune God is to start with Jesus. Stuff's broke down here. Sin breaks stuff. Uh, the Trinity not only helps us acknowledge that stuff's broke down here, but it even helps us find comfort in the face of it because now we can find God at work to save us in the middle of it. Now we can find God when things are not broken, not by sort of like contriving a spiritual experience, not by trying to impose order on a world that does not seem to want to hold it to stick, uh, but, but rather by finding God bearing the cross when everything else is falling apart to save you, me, and all the world. Where is God when I can't find him? He's dying on the cross. Where is God when everything hurts? He's dying on the cross. And how can I get to God now? Well, through the Holy Spirit, through the word and the sacraments. And now I have a triune God that actually brings me comfort and hope and, and salvation. I have a God who hates how much things hurt down here so much that he sent his son and his son willingly went to bear the cross. And even now we are not on our own until heaven, but the Holy Spirit through word and sacrament gathers us together, grants us peace, grants us forgiveness for the things that we have done to make this worse and actually grants us hope in a salvation that we are already now tied to. When we talk about the Trinity, we end up talking about salvation in action today, here, now, for you, for me, for all. And this is what matters. We have a mediator. This is John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not just that we have one mediator. That's true, but it's, it's more. Now, because we know who our mediator is, we can know that his work is already finished. This is Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Uh, he has sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We now have a mediator of grace who gives forgiveness. We have a God who has worked in action in time and space to save us so that when we cannot explain even the, the intricacies of who he is, we can still confess it. And when we can't even explain the intricacies of how bad things are down here, we can find our salvation. Uh, we are saved because the Son died and rose, because the Spirit uh, has given you word and sacrament that you would be baptized, that you would be brought faith, that you would cling to Jesus, and by being brought to Jesus, you would be brought 
to the Father, to salvation, to hope, and, and to deliverance from all of these awful things. Here we can actually finally start to speak of God as being good, not simply by saying God is in control and like squint because it doesn't really look like it, or I can really feel God today unless I stub my toe and then it just hurts. Uh, but, but rather we can speak about God as being good because he has done good things. He has sacrificed himself to save you. He has worked in love, in sacrificial love, not for those who have chosen him, but for those whom he has chosen all the world. He has died for all the world. And, and here we can speak about love not simply as a feeling, but as an action in time and space. We have concrete definitions for terms like good and love. And that means that we don't have to define them anymore. And it also means that we don't get to define them anymore, which is mostly how everybody else wants to do religion today. We, we try and define what good and love are based on something that we would want. And here instead, to speak about God as triune, it matters because it defines for us good. It defines for us love, and it actually gives us hope to cling to even in the face of it. So uh, that's who the Trinity is, and that's why it matters. This is the Drive to School podcast, and uh, hopefully you're at school by now.